Well, tonight I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Second Chronicles and chapter number 7. Now, before, I know what some of you are going to do. In your mind, you're like, oh, yeah, Second Chronicles 7.14. Nope, don't get ahead of me, all right? Uh, that's, that's really, uh, we'll, we'll kind of close with that, but not in the way that you might think. Uh, that it, it will will go or will be, but Second Chronicles chapter seven and verse number fourteen. When uh, I guess your pastor and I have known each other uh, long distance for a couple of years now, but had never met in person until just uh, yesterday, and I've enjoyed that. Get to know him and his family, and give the girls a hard time, and and uh, we've enjoyed getting to fellowship together. But when he and I were speaking a few months ago, um, uh, really even while we were on the phone. Uh, I had been reading in this passage, and God just put this on my heart, and so uh, I trust. I told him at that time, I said, well, I believe I know what the Lord would have, and um, so we're going to give it a go. I, if I was going to title tonight's message, I would just title it this, What You Want to See Where the People of God Meet. What You Want to See Where the People of God Meet. And uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 6 is where we're going to... I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, let your eyes fall on Second Chronicles chapter number 6 first before we get into Second Chronicles chapter number 7. In chapter number 6, we find the time of the dedication of the temple. Now, I want to ask you to think about this before we go further. The dedication of the temple. The temple of God. This is the place of worship, yes or no? It's the place where the people of God would gather. Is that right? All right, now, we're going to be here all night if you don't uh, kind of get in with the program, all right? So, it, it's a place of worship, yes or no? It's a place where the people of God would gather together, is that right? It's also the place where the power of God was present. It was manifested on numerous occasions with the Shekinah glory of God, the pillar of fire by day and the pillar of fire by night. And, and there were times when, when uh, as God would lead His people through that pillar, we, we know that when the temple was built, then the presence of God began to reside there. And God would meet with His people uh, uh, through the temple. In, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, from verses number 13 down to 42, don't worry, we're not going to read them all, alright? In 2 Chronicles 6, 13 through 42, we find Solomon's prayer. And Solomon is getting ready. It's the dedication of the temple. And Solomon's beginning to pray. And I, I want to just ask you to, again, we're not going to read all the verses, so I'm just going to ask you to kind of let your eyes fall on some verses. I want to call some things to your attention. I'm going to try to move quickly so that we can get to the heart of the message. It's kind of like we've got a little appetizer, and then we're going to have the main course, all right? So let's make quick work of the appetizer. In the first few verses, we see that worship is offered to God. Look at verse number 14, Second Chronicles 6 and verse number 14. The Bible says this, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like Thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepeth covenant, and showest mercy unto Thy servants, that walk before Thee with all their hearts. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like Thee in the heaven, nor in the earth. I'm just going to tell you tonight, I'm thankful that we serve the risen, living Savior. Amen. The God of all of heaven and earth. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so they begin to worship God and they're offering this worship to the Lord. And notice the worship they, they offer to Him. First of all, it begins with simply worshiping the fact of who He is. I want, I want to... Uh, listen... I was a pastor for many years, and I'm afraid that many times we come into church and we, we're thinking about, oh God, I, I need something tonight. And, and we're, we're, we're more focused on ourselves. Lord, I need encouragement. I, I need prayer. I have this great need that you know, Father, that what it's about, and, and, and I'm going to bring that to you. Well, how about what do we bring to Him? You know, sometimes uh, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're, uh, how many of you have children? Sometimes we're the bad kids because we come up to our father like this instead of like this. Why don't, why don't we take some time in, in our personal life and when we come to church, just, just start letting it start with worship of the fact of who He is and, 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 and not, not be coming to God like this, always expecting that God's going to give us something. Now, I want you to understand, God will give you when you come looking for something. 
But I, I think that we, we've gone too far in that so, so oftentimes we come in and there is no worship about who He is. We've forgotten what, about what biblical worship is. In verse number 14, they worship Him for who He is. In verse number 14, they worship Him because of His divine faithfulness. Notice the phrase, keepest covenant. The fact that God is faithful. I'm glad that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm glad that I serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Matthew and Mark and Peter and John. I'm glad that my God doesn't change. Time changes, but God never changes. His divine faithfulness. Verse number 14. Oh man, look at the end of verse number 14. And I could just camp on this verse alone, but notice what he says in verse number 14. And showest mercy unto thy servants. I don't know who you are, but I know who I am. And I'm thankful that God shows mercy unto me. In His mercy, we do not get what we deserve. In His grace, we get what we don't deserve. But in His mercy, we do not get what we really deserve. Look at verse number 15. They worship Him because of His promises. I'm not going to take time to stop on that. I'm thankful for the promises of God. At the end of verse number 14, His hand, or 15 rather, His hand of blessings. I'm thankful for the blessings of God. Amen. In in verse number 17, the fact of the truth of His Word. They're worshiping. They're just... And Solomon, as, as he begins to uh, have this dedication time, he goes to before the Lord, before he ever gets to the dedication, uh, he goes to the Lord with, with worship, and he worships God for the truth of His Word. I'm thankful tonight that what God has promised me in this old book, I know that it's true. I'm glad that He's not going to forsake me. I'm, he's not going to forsake His Word. I'm glad that while politicians everywhere around the world lie, Croatia is in the top ten most corrupt countries in all of Europe. I'm glad that while poli- by, by politicians around the world are going to lie, that my Father in Heaven has not lied to me once. And what He said, He will do. The promises of the Word of God are still as true for us today as they were for Solomon in Second Chronicles. God is still God. He has not lessened. He's not grown deaf. He's not become weak in fulfilling the promises that God has made to us in His Word. Then in verse number 18, man, this ought to make a Presbyterian want to shout right here. Verse number 18, notice what he says. How much less this house, or I'm sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse number 18, but uh, will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold heaven and the earth, and the heaven, I'm sorry, behold heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. You know, if you read that, and I kind of messed it up in reading, but if you read that a time or two through, what you'll see, Solomon is praising God. He's worshiping God for the fact that He is present among men. Present among men. Then if you'll notice, after Solomon offers worship to God for who He is, for His divine faithfulness, for His mercy, for His promises, for His hand of blessings, for the truth of His Word, and for the present, for His presence among us. Then Solomon moves on to begin to make some requests to God. Still in chapter 6, please. Notice what Solomon says in verse number 19. Oh God, hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. Verse 20. Regard this place. God, this temple is a special place. It's where you meet with your people. Would you regard this place? In verses 22 and 23, he seeks forgiveness for for his own sins and the sins of the people. In verse 24 through 29, he asks God, please be long-suffering. Can I get an amen right there? Man, is is it a wonder that America even exists anymore? How much longer? I don't know. How much is God going to put up with the foolishness that we see in America? There's a whole lot of times I turn on the television in Croatia and I sure am thankful I don't live here anymore. God, please be long-suffering. Verses 28, 29, and 30. This is a message in itself. I'll let you look at those verses 28, 29, and 30. Solomon prays for grace through afflictions. Grace through afflictions. 
Can I just kind of get a little bit of a witness and a testimony tonight? How many of us have ever been through afflictions? Raise your hand. I wonder if maybe there'd be somebody say, you know what, preacher, right now I'm going through, through, through some afflictions and I need the grace of God. Can, would you just be unashamed about that, somebody? A few? All right. We need grace through afflictions. And Solomon is praying and he's asking God, give us your grace during times of affliction. Verses 32 and 33, that really applies to us. Remember, I'm almost done with the appetizer. We're getting to the main course. Verse 32 and 33, he says this, Receive the Gentiles. Wait a minute. I don't think we have any Jews here in South Georgia, do we? Are we in South Georgia? Any Jews in here tonight? How many would say, Amen, the fact that God received the Gentiles? He, he's, he's beginning, he's asking God, Lord, when the strangers come and they want to proclaim your name, they're going to worship you as we worship you. And God, they recognize you for who you are. You're the Lord God Jehovah. And they want to worship you. God, don't forsake them. Don't push them to the side. Now, I want to just kind of get off on just a little bit of a tangent here tonight. And I know where I'm at. I'm in South Georgia. But I'm, rec- I'm representing Croatia tonight. Listen, if you have a hard time with somebody that doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, doesn't act like you, doesn't speak the same language you do, you're going to have an awful time hard in, in heaven, my friend. The Bible says in multiple places all throughout the, the Scripture we find it is people of all nations and kindreds and t- tribes and tongues. Amen! It's going to be a hodgepodge of people in heaven I'm thankful that God can save us to the uttermost and the fact that it's a whosoever will gospel. God doesn't pick and choose who goes. It's a whosoever will may come. You saw the pictures. I'm thankful for what God has done. I never imagined that I would go from Oklahoma 6,000 miles halfway around the world and God would let me minister to people from over 20 different countries. I don't, did you catch that? There was times, what I would do is I would preach in English, and while Igor was translating into, into Croatian, a man by the name of Innocent, Innocent was a black man, that's his real name, Innocent. Innocent was out in our foyer with a television screen and, and a speaker out there, and Innocent would translate, while Igor was translating into Croatian, Innocent would translate into French for our black French speaking people from the Congo. In the auditorium, sometimes those from the Philippines that spoke Tagalog, they didn't understand something. They turned to one of their neighbors and they would ask, and you could hear Tagalog. And after services, there might be someone from the Congo that didn't understand, or the person from Nigeria didn't understand what the person from the Congo said, and they would start speaking an African dialect back and forth. And then there's Odunya that was just deaf, and she couldn't understand anything from anybody, but she understood lips in Croatian. I'm thankful that God is a whosoever will God. He's saying, Lord, please receive the Gentiles. Look at verse number 34. He prays and asks for God for divine protection and victory in battles. Verses 36 through 39, he asks God for mercy. In verse number 40, he says again, Lord, simply hear our prayer. In verse number 41 and 42, and all of these, in any one could be a message by itself. In verse 41 and 42, he says, let us know your presence and your power. You know what we need more of in our churches today is the presence and the power of God. But I want to ask you to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, the first two verses. In 2 Chronicles 7, verses 1 and 2, this is the end of Solomon's prayer, and this is the beginning of God's response, if I could put it that way. Verse 1, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying... Here's God responding. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Praise His name. Now the next few verses, I'm going to continue to go quickly. And this is where the the title of the message comes from. What What we should want to see where the people of God meet. Look in verse number 3. The Bible says, When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement 
and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. They had the same vision. The same vision. What do you mean by that, Pastor Brad? I, I want us to understand tonight where the people of God meet, whether it be Lighthouse Baptist Church in Plains or Americas, Georgia, or whether it be Novi Zivo, Neovisino, Baptista, Caserta in Zagreb, Croatia, where, where the people of God meet, the people of God ought to have the same vision. Recognizing God for who He is. Realizing what God has done. The people of God, they saw what God had done. They saw how that God had answered the prayer of Solomon. They saw the presence of God. And together they bowed themselves before Him. They responded with humility and with worship and with praise. And notice the end of verse number 3. And this is what they said. For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. They have the same vision of who God is. Verse number 4. I'll put it this way. They sacrificed together. Notice verse number 4. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. Now, unless somebody gets the wrong idea right here. By the way, you're not listening right now. But unless someone gets the wrong idea right now. All I told him when we spoke a few months ago was, I believe I know what the Lord would have me to preach. Your pastor, I have no, he has not talked to me about you. So if I step on your toes, get some steel boots and get over it, you big crybaby. I'm just telling you tonight, we, we have not talked about what God is doing or what's happening or things that might be happening in this church. I have no idea. But when it says all the people brought sacrifices before God. Somebody help me. I I may not be the sharpest crayon in the box, but if I understand the word all, it means all. Uh, That's deep, isn't it? All the people brought sacrifices. Listen to some of these statistics, though. And I know it may not necessarily apply to Lighthouse Baptist Church or to independent Baptist churches, but stay with me for just a moment. In 2013, a study was done among Southern Baptist giving, and they found that an, only an average of 2.3% of their income was given. The tithe, in other words, was 2.3%. General studies in Christendom, in other words, everybody understand Christendom? That's like everybody that proclaims themselves to be Christian. General studies in Christendom show that less than 25% of all people claiming to be Christians tithe. Subsplash, which is a... A study group says that 75 to 90 percent of church members, not goers, church members do not tithe or give regularly. What about sacrificial giving? All the people, they sacrificed together. And you know what that means? That means, you know what that means? That means if you got a job at Chick-fil-A, I'm going to pick on the daughter one more. You got a job at Chick-fil-A, you ought to be tithing because you're making money. That you don't have to make, but by the grace of God, He gives you the strength and He gave you the job. So you ought to be tithing. You ought to be giving to God sacrificially. Well, what about sacrificial service? Again, studies show that 20% of the people do 80% of the work in any given church. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. You say, but that's not us. Praise God if it's not. But what are you doing? What are you doing? Say, well, it's past my, I'm, I'm past my prime, Pastor Brad. That's somebody else's job. Hey, if God still gives you life and breath and health and strength, you ought to be doing what you can to serve God. If that means you're licking envelopes to put them in the mail. Bless God, you still got spit. You can do something. How many of us are glad, how many of us are glad to use clean bathrooms? Ever dawned on you that somebody's got to clean them? I'm just saying. It's kind of getting quiet in here except for the baby. We need to have, and that's, I can preach over any baby. It's not, doesn't bother me at all. Same vision. What should we see where the people of God meet? Same vision, sacrificing together. Notice verse number five and verse number six. Same vision, sacrificing together, surrender. You see, in verse five and six, They dedicated, all the people gathered together to dedicate the temple to the Lord. You know what that means? It means that they gave it up. Well, this is our church. 
That's my pew. How dare someone sit in my seat? Oh, hogwash. Giving it up. You see, surrender is a state of heart and a state of mind. Notice what it says in verse 5 and 6. The priests waited on their offices. The Levites with their instruments of music. You see, it was their ministry. Everyone found a place to minister and they were ministering together. It's a state of mind and heart. They're not concerned with what someone else was doing or what somebody else was not doing. They just said, I'm not concerned about what he's doing or what she's doing. I need to be concerned about what I can do for God. And they were each one finding a way that they could minister and surrender themselves to God. To be used of God in His service for His honor and glory. Again, if it's licking envelopes, then be the best envelope licker the church has ever had. Hey, did I tell you folks that I was a pastor of a church for like 18, 20 years? Not just one, but pastored three churches in that time. We started one from scratch. And I was an interim pastor and been there, done that. Same vision. They sacrificed together. Surrender together. They, Verse 6, they stood together. Now I understand the context of the verse and notice what it says at the end of verse number 6. When the priest sounded the trumpets before them and all Israel stood. You see, there's the application that they, they all stood together. They're taking a stand. And we could, we could apply that. They're taking a stand for the things of God and taking a stand for that which was right and taking a stand for the fact of true worship and biblical worship that's being exemplified before them. And they're not afraid to take a stand and be identified. This is the kind of place we want to worship in. This is the kind of worship that honors God. This is the kind of worship that I want to be a part of. But not only that, they stood together. They stood together. I, I need a... Uh, let's see. I met you and your son earlier, right? Remind me your last name one more. Russell. Russell. Would the two Russell fellows come and help me? <clears throat> they, they stood together. Just right there in the front would be great. Um, now, I need... Uh, okay. All right. Pastor, you're going to come and stand here. And uh, they stood together. They stood together. No, no, no. You stand there. They stood together. something to be said about that. Men that will stand with their pastor. Now come back over here. You two fellas, come back over here. Please. It's hard to get good help these days. Now preacher, you turn this way. No, no, no. Just turn this way. It's hard to get good help these days. Now you fellas turn that way. It's a whole lot better to stand with each other than against each other. Are you listening to me tonight? I tell you, I don't care male, female, young man, old man, you should never position yourself like this against the man of God unless he's biblically wrong. But what you should do is say, we're going to stand together. And now to say, you know what, preacher? Preacher? We're behind you. We got you back. So much so that when some... I'm going to get myself into trouble right here. When somebody wants to come up behind the preacher and stab him in the back, he's got some good men behind him that will say, uh-uh, you ain't going to do that to my pastor. Uh, by the way, if I didn't tell you all, I was a pastor for almost 20 years. Stand together. 
what we ought to see where the people of God meet is standing together. Not standing against each other, but standing together. All right, all of you can be seated. Thank you very much. Give them a hand. <laughs> um, can I take a rough survey, though? How many of you, whether in this church or in some other church, have ever been in a church where people on this side of the church didn't go along with people on that side of the church and they literally stood against each other at times? Now you tell me, you think that honors God? What kind of testimony is that to visitors? What kind of testimony is that to the lost in the, in the people of Plains or in the people of, uh, I'm America, so I had to think for a minute where I was at. I'm just saying. Not face to face, but side by side. Verse number 8, they served together. They had the same vision. They sacrificed together. They surrendered together. They stood together. They served together. Look at verse 8. We spoke about this previously. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But notice what it says in verse number 8. It talks about the steadfastness and their faithfulness in verse number 8. And the same, also at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, and a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. All Israel together. Seven days. Oh, Come on, Solomon, don't you know we're tired of this by now? I mean, you want to have another revival meeting? Or like right now, preacher, the missionary, doesn't he know that it's 738? They serve together. Faithfulness and steadfastness. They didn't say, "Well, you know what? We're tired of this. I don't think we're going to do this anymore." Solomon, if you want to have if you want to have the revival service the rest of the time, you go. But we just can't come tonight. We're, we're going to go. We're going to go. You know. By the way, aren't we going to go to down there? We're going to go to Chick Fil A after church if the preacher hurries up, right? They kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, and then. The most famous verse from this passage. Skip down to verse number 14. But before you do, look at verse 13. He says, If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. If this happens, you know what you do? They submitted together. And they prayed together. Notice again verse number 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You see, all through the passage, it's plural. It was something that they did together. The people themselves. And then notice, there, there, T-H-E-I-R, T-H, there. In verse number 14. Shall humble themselves and turn from their, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What we should see where the people of God meet. That's what God desires. That's what God desires right here in America, Georgia. Whether there's 20 or 200. I want to ask you to stand together tonight. All I can say is this. I know that I brought the message the Lord would have. How's your worship? Would you, would you not come to Him tonight like this, but maybe just fall on your faces like they did and worship Him for who He is and thank God for His divine faithfulness, for His mercy, for His promises, and for His hand of blessing, for the truth of His Word. And just, just come tonight. Don't ask God for anything, but just worship Him for who He is. After you do that, if God gives you the liberty, then make your request to Him. God, hear my prayer. Regard this place. Give me forgiveness. God, I need long suffering. I need Your mercy. I need Your grace. Lord, I, I need grace during this affliction that I'm going through, whatever the case would be. But remember tonight, church, it's about what God desires where the people of God meet. Same vision. Sacrificing together. Surrendering together. Standing together. Serving together. Submitting together. Praying together. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Pastor, I'm going to have you come and take the service and the rest of the service as you see fit. God, I pray tonight that you'd be honored, not just in the, what's been said and the words that have been preached, but Lord, most importantly, 
in our response. Mine, these that are here tonight, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be sensitive to hear and smart enough to obey as you speak. I pray these things in Jesus' name.